pleasure to see quite so many people gathered here for the first of what is going to be a series of sessions here at this year's WEF on geopolitics, past, present and future. And although this might sound like a sort of Davos staple, in fact, it's worth remembering in some senses how recent many of the things we're going to discuss today are in terms of their importance. In the lifetimes of at least some people who are here today, the Cold War is something that we live through rather than being simply a memory. And of course, during that time, what the historian John Lewis Gaddis referred to as the long peace, an almost frozen system of international um, engagement, was something that seemed to be very much not just of the present, but to be stretching on infinitely into the future. Whereas for people of the age of my daughter, age nine, the Cold War is probably about as relevant as the Holy Roman Empire, to name another uh, no longer uh, entirely uh, valid uh, political system. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to use that lens of the present to talk, first of all, today about the past of geopolitics, understand some of the big systems and the big frameworks which have shaped the way in which different parts of the world have come together and operated. And each of our speakers today is going to take a slightly different at, uh, um, approach to the way in which that comes forward. The first is Robert Kaplan. He will be known to many people here as a prolific and very well-respected author on a variety of geopolitical issues. He's currently a senior fellow at the Center for New, Amer uh, New American Security, but he will be also known to many as a regular writer for many years in The Atlantic magazine and the author of many books, including uh, my own personal favorite, The Revenge of Geography, which I have to say... Um, Robert sounds to be a bit, a little bit like it's been designed for a Hollywood movie. So maybe geography in that would be played by Bruce Willis or someone taking the, uh, taking the revenge. <laughs> to respond to Robert, we will have Professor Tim Snyder, who is the Richard C. Levin Chair in History at Yale University. Again, a prolific and very um, well-regarded author, particularly on the history of the mid 20th century in Europe. His books, Bloodlands and Black Earth, have won many awards and have uh, engendered much discussion. And his most recent book on tyranny looks at the way in which certain behavioral patterns by leaders need to be approached, in some cases condemned. Although I'm sure there's no one here at Davos who could possibly fit that sort of description, Tim, or let's hope so anyway. And in the middle and giving our uh, final response, uh, Brila Skota, who is Executive Director of the Center for Religion and Civic Culture at the University of Southern California. And Bree's work covers many areas, but one of them is the way in which religious pluralism and engagement between faith communities can be engendered in a more positive and more interactive way than sometimes happens in a world where the discourse and the dialogue is often between the deaf rather than the willing. So a very, very distinguished panel here. After we've heard from them, there'll be plenty of time for the audience here to give us questions and thoughts. So please start preparing those thoughts now, ready to burst out when our speakers have, uh, have finished. But I wonder if we might start, start um, Robert, by asking you to lead us off on the question of empires, civilization, and the struggle for Eurasia. Would you uh, lead us uh, off? <clears throat> yes, thank you so much, Rana. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm gonna try to do all of Eurasia in 20 minutes um, and get granular at the same time if I possibly can. Keep in mind that technology has not defeated geography. What's happened is something more subtle, that technology has shrunk geography. It's made the world smaller, more claustrophobic, more anxious, more nervous. So that, um, so that Eurasia, which used to just be a high school geography term because it was too big to actually mean anything, um, is now increasingly a cohering system of trade, rivalry, and even conflict. And the way to understand it is really uh, through the history of civilizations, empires, dynasties, because all of these powers that are interacting today, whether it's Russia, China, India, Iran, or Turkey, for most of their history, especially um, early modern, modern history, medieval history, were classified as empires of one kind or another. So we cannot escape the, you know, the concept of empire, which I'm going to use today as a thought experiment. I'm not going to defend it. I'm just going to use it as a thought experiment.
in order to understand in order to understand things. It's sort of the tragedy of history is that empire was required to to um, uh, to deliver order of some kind or another usually, um, and. So now we start. Take China at the beginning. Everyone is talking about belt, the Belt and Road <laughs> Initiative or One Belt, One Road. Um, what does it mean? Well, if you layer the, the trade routes of the Tang Dynasty, the Tang Empire, in the early medieval period, especially the ninth century, on top of the Wan Dynasty, uh, medieval period, time of Marco Polo, 13th, early 14th century, and you layer them together and Marco Polo, and look at Marco Polo's path as a geographical framing device for this whole discussion, you will uh, wind up with Belt and Road, with the Belt and Road Initiative. Because the Belt and Road Initiative, when you look at the map of it, is really um, it, takes its, it takes its vision from China's medieval dynasties uh, um, and the trade routes that connected China to Europe um, during that period. Now, one belt, one road is a number of things that do not get emphasized enough uh, in the media. First, it's a branding operation. For, wh for what the Chinese have already built in terms of roads, railways, pipelines across Central Asia. Uh, uh, you know, again, along Marco Polo's path. These are things that were built before the word Belt and Road Initiative was even discussed. And the purpose of these roads, railways, pipelines, in addition to bringing in hydrocarbons from from Central Asia, oil and natural gas directly into Western China so that China would be less dependent on the Strait of Malacca uh, uh, you know, for, for oil deliveries. Um, the real objective of it is to link China organically with Iran. Iran is the real prize in Belt and Road. Iran is the geographical, geopolitical organizing principle of the greater Middle East. A population of 80 million, highly educated, fronting both hydrocarbon areas, not only the Persian Gulf, but the pa Caspian Sea as well. And the Chinese are investing in Iran. They're mining for minerals there. They're building railroads. So Belt and Road, like the first thing about it is roads, railways, pipelines, making this organic, unbeatable alliance between China and Iran, and the Tang Dynasty of the ninth century had trade routes right into Khorasan in northeastern Iran. So this is very much in keeping with Chinese history. And the second thing about Belt and Road, again, dealing with the demons of Chinese history, is China is age old. It goes back to antiquity. But the western part of China, the Muslim Turkic Uyghur area only joined China in recent centuries. And so Belt and Road does a number of things. It surrounds the Uyghurs by preventing them forever having a rear base in the former Soviet Central Asian Turkic republics. Um, it also lifts up or intends to lift up their standard of living by developing these cities, Urumqi, Kashgar, and others, to give them less of an opportunity or less of a, an incentive to revolt. And by doing that, it does something very unique to ch for China, which is all we read about in China is South China Sea, East China Sea, China building ships, sending ships in. But if you look at it, China actually has a very weak maritime tradition. Except for the early Ming Dynasty in the early 15th century with the, uh, with the treasure fleets of Chong Ho, China really wasn't a maritime power. And why wasn't it a maritime power? Because it was too insecure on land in whatever dynasty or empire. And by one belt, one road, it you know, solves this dilemma. It makes China even more secure than it already is, giving China the luxury to concentrate on building a great navy and challenging the United States in the South and East China Sea. Um, you know, it solves this demon in Chinese history. And 
what is China's goal? Again, we're back to history. Um, while Europe was engaged in B Westphalian balance of power poli politics um, with periodic wars, Asia in the early modern and modern era under what was, a, you know, in, by, in comparative terms, a benign tributary system where China was the top dog, but it was not an overbearing imperialism, really. It was a way to synchronize power relationships. And uh, an academic who brings this out brilliantly is David, D David Kang at the University of Southern California um, who does this. So China believes, and the Chinese have spoken about this, that their vision for Asia is a very benign vision that lifts up all boats, makes everybody richer, where they will, where, where they will emphasize, they will uh, you know, orchestrate a kind of weak, benevolent form of former Chinese um, tributary imperial systems uh, you know, as the Americans move further and further away uh, from, uh, um, from, from, the coast of, from the coast of Asia. Now, moving away from China, um, we go to Russia. Now, I know that we tend to make a Manichaean dichotomy, a necessary one, between democracy and dictatorship. But there's also an, there are also other dichotomies. One thing I've learned as a journalist over the decades is that the differences between one authoritarian system and another authoritarian system are often as great as the differences between an, one authoritarian system and a democratic system. And the Russian system is very different from China. Again, going back to history and geography. Russia covers half the longitudes of the Earth. It's an insecure land power. It has few or f too few um, uh, geographical barriers to invasion. So that Russia was invaded from the West by, of course, we know, Napoleon and Hitler, but also to some extent by Poles, Lithuanians, Swedes, even Teutonic Knights, etc. So Russia feels very insecure on its western border historically. Um, however, Russia knows that the Warsaw Pact is not coming back. It was too expensive to maintain. Uh, what, what Russia seeks is, I believe, um, a weak, more traditional form of empire in Central Eastern Europe. But it's a different form of empire than the Chinese empire. Remember, Russia, because it was so insecure, had a tendency towards absolutism, towards outright con conquest, far less subtle than the Chinese <coughs> imperial vision. And so the Russians, um, you take the Russians, and when I was a journalist in Romania in 2012-13, I got very frustrated because I was writing articles that nobody wanted to publish about how Putin was using various forms of subversion in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, buying me, trying to buy media through third parties, bribing local politicians, running organized crime, uh, operations using disinformation, cyber campaigns, etc. Uh, because between the end of the Kosovo War and the beginning of um, uh, the Maidan crisis, uh, Europe, except for the European Economic Union, which was a, an economic big story, was not sexy in the news for a period. It, it got. It, it only happened with Maidan, really, that Europe. You know, people focused on Europe as they did during the 90s in Bosnia and Kosovo, um, et cetera. And so the, the Russian form of subversion is not benign like China. It's not making everyone rich the way China is making everyone kind of rich, you know, especially in Western Australia, <laughs> um, in various parts of Asia. Uh, you know, Russia is just beating people down, it seems. It's weakening uh, Central Eastern Europe or trying to undermine um, democratic systems from Estonia in the north to Bulgaria in the south. And this, you know, people say that Putin is a new czar. I believe there are a few, a few liberalizing czars. I mean, uh, you know, czars who are progressive for their time by the standards of that time. 
and therefore it's kind of an insult to some czars to compare <laughs> um, Putin, Putin, um, Putin to him. But because the Russian form of empire was always different from the Chinese, the Russian form of influence, of subversion in Central Eastern Europe is different than what the Chinese have been doing you know, it, you know, throughout, throughout East Asia. Well, we come to Iran. And if any of you have had the privilege to travel through Iran as I have, you know that Iran is a, you know, Iranians have a civilizational sense of themselves as rich as that of Indians, Chinese, or Japanese. And, um, and, it's, and it's a civilization rooted in geography and in empire. Um, Iranians of one form or another have lived on the Iranian plateau since middle antiquity. The Achaemenids, the Sassanids, uh, the Medes, the Parthians, you know, the various, you know, Iranian-related empires, most of them basically governed from on or near the Mediterranean Sea eastward to what is today central Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, on that map, it's a little bit confusing because there's orange and red, but that's the overlap of the Ottoman and, and Achaemenid Empire. So actually, Iran goes all the way to, to almost the Mediterranean Sea. And if you look where Iran is influential today, whether by supporting proxy militias, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, operating in, in Yemen, in, you know, in, in Lebanon, in Syria, et cetera, and where the Iranian currency circulates in, we in the western half of Afghanistan, you're seeing basically the same contours of Iranian empires of old. Um, you know, the Ayatollahs may be very religious, but there also, uh, there's also an element, a strain of Persian imperialism in how they operate in the greater Middle East, um, uh, which is, um, it, you know, which will be true even in a post-Ayatollah regime if one comes. You know, we can't know the future of Iran, but looking at the past for 2,500 years, we know Iran is always going to be consequential, it's a real state. It's not an artificial contraption. It has deeply rooted institutions, whether under the Ayatollahs or previous empires or, or governments. It's much more organic, organically defined through history than most Arab countries. There are, there are some exceptions. Um, and you know, one thing I've always found interesting is that what really, in one respect, is empire? Um, empire is not just invading, it's training proxy militaries. It's training host country militaries to do the imperial policing for you. Uh, the British did this, the French did this. Um, the Americans do this with what's called FID, Foreign Internal Defense, where Army Special Forces and certain Marine units train host country militaries. Well, the Iranians are brilliant at this. Uh, you know, I would say that the reason they've been so good at training proxy forces in Syria to defend Assad, the reason they were so good at harassing the Americans in Iraq a decade ago is because this is very much in keeping with an imperial tradition, you know, of using host country forces. Um, going uh, further along, um, we have Turkey for a moment. Um, Turkey, of course, the Seljuk Empire, the Ottoman Empire in medieval history, early modern, and even modern history. And I use the word Ottoman, not Turkish Empire, because it was a multi-ethnic empire, um, you know, of, of, of various communities where the Eastern Orthodox had actually better relations with the Muslims than they had with the Western Catholics for a long period of time. It was a very multifaceted, multi uh, a, a multicultural empire. And it, you know, when I started reporting from Turkey in the early 1980s, uh, Turkey had a prime minister, Turgut Özal. And Turgut Özal had this philosophy of this policy of neo-Ottomanism, that the, he was going to use the Ottoman model in order to move closer to the 
Kurds, because they were both Muslims, closer to the Turkic Central Asians, closer to the Arabs in an economic sense. Well, Özal died very early in 1993. And then we had later on Ahmed Davetoglu, who was uh, Erdogan's foreign minister, who also had an element of an Ottoman power projection policy. Now, these may not have worked out very well at all. Uh, Turkey may have misjudged its capacity to actually influence events in the Middle East, uh, you know, in, in, in Syria and other places. But the, my point is only that to understand Turkey and Turkey's goals and its insecurities, you have to look at the Ottoman legacy. Um, finally, there's India. And here I get to India and China. Um, India, you, you know, if you look at the map of Indian empires, Malran, uh, Kushan, Mughal, and others, you'll find something curious. Often, whoever ruled in Delhi also ruled throughout what is today Pakistan and, and throughout much of Afghanistan today. Whereas during the Mughal Empire, you often had um, rule over Pakistan and Afghanistan from Delhi, but the extreme southern part of India was out of the Mughal, uh, at, you know, out of the Mughal range. So that when Indians care about Afghanistan, and they care deeply about it, it's, it, you know, it has its basis in history. Afghanistan is not far from India. It's almost part of the subcontinent um, in that sense. And while China is moving south towards the Indian Ocean, um, building, building ports or helping to finance ports throughout the Indian Ocean, ports that I've visited, um, India is also you know, engaged in building, route, in building a route with Iran from the Indian Ocean, north through Western Afghanistan to counter Pakistani influence deep into Central Asia. Well, so it's the Pakistanis and the Chinese trying to build a route from Gwadar in Pakistan north into Western China versus the Indians and the Iranians trying to build an alternative route just to the west from, um, you know, uh, from Chabahar north directly into, uh, through Western Afghanistan and directly into Central Asia. So the future is actually linking Central Asia to the Indian Ocean. And I emphasize oceans because we lit, globalization is a maritime age. 90% of goods that travel from one continent to another do so by sea. Yeah, um, and let me just close up and state this, that the Indian Ocean is the global energy interstate taking oil and gas goes from <coughs> the Middle East to the, to the middle class conurbations in East Asia. And in order to really access the Indian Ocean, the Chinese Navy needs to dominate the South China Sea. And, the, and I'll end with this. Uh, the Chinese are doing nothing in the South China Sea that the Americans did not do in the Caribbean in the 19th and early 20th century. The American empire of sorts began in the Caribbean by dominating the Western Hemisphere, and the Chi new Chinese empire of sorts um, begins in the South China Sea to provide access to the Indian Ocean, so China will have a maritime sphere all the way from the East China Sea to Djibouti, where China is building a military installation at the mouth of the Red Sea. And I'll stop. Robert, many thanks indeed for, I think, taking us around half the world in 20 minutes, which is really quite an achievement. Um, we're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, further commentary from our other two speakers. Two very brief thoughts that occurred to me off the back of your comments, and very stimulating way to think about why we should start remembering empires. One is to ask, where nation states fit in. The countries you've talked about, Iran, China, and Russia, all, of course, empires that have struggled with their identity as modern nation states in the present day era, and <coughs> how that has sometimes been a rather unhappy marriage. And second, of course, one identity that goes right across this region, crossing boundaries, which, of course, is religion. Islam is perhaps the faith that's most obviously thought of in this context, but Buddhism is sometimes forgotten as another one that goes very much across those boundaries too. So I suspect there'll be plenty 
of grounds for discussion and debate off the back of what you've, uh, you've said. But the thought of nationalism brings me to Tim Snyder, who amongst other things is a very distinguished historian of that, but he will, I think, now be responding in his own way to Robert's comments. Tim. Okay, great. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to respond to such a fruitful presentation. What I'd like to do is, is begin with what I take to be an exception to, to the rule that Bob made and then work my way back towards the main thrust of his argument. I, I'm a historian who writes about territory and nation, so I can't disagree with the main point that territory still matters. However, I do think something has changed in the 21st century. There is a way of projecting power in the 21st century that did not exist in the 20th and back for the previous couple of millennia, and that is electronically. It is possible in principle to win a cyber war without any physical or territorial contact with the enemy, and that is something new, and it's worth thinking about. If one considers what Clausewitz says about war, he says the goal of war is to break or to change the will of the enemy. And then he also says, and it's an important qualification, he says now the way that we do this is by combat on the battlefield. And indeed, for the previous several thousand years, that is generally how the will of the enemy was broken or changed, by combat on the battlefield. That Clausewitz imagines that that might not be the case. Combat is a means to an end. The end is breaking or changing the will of the enemy. With cyber, it is theoretically, and I believe it's now been demonstrated to be practically possible, to change the will of an enemy from a distance without making physical contact. And of course, the great example of this is what I think will be seen as the, the, the extraordinary, awful, or splendid, depending on your point of view, defeat of the United States in the first major cyber war of our century in 2016. The result of which is that the President of the United States is the payload of a Russian cyber weapon. That sort of thing <laughs> could not have, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny if you're from where you are, but if you're from where I am, it's less funny. Um, so, so, so this, this, this creates a situation which I think is, in fact, different. I mean, there, and there are various ways to, to look at it. One is to think about geography and, and human contact. If the average American spends 11 hours a day in front of a screen, that's a different attitude to the physical world. That means the physical world is less important to you. Another way to think about this is in terms of, of ethnic conflict. Traditionally, and this is, this, was, this is Rana's question, if you're going to think about an ethnic conflict in, in Eurasia, you'd be thinking in terms of territories where the minorities actually live. In a cyber war, you can play on a non-geographical ethnic conflict, for example, African Americans and whites in the United States, without having any presence on either of the territories. That's now possible and has been proven to be possible. Or by comparison to the Cold War. One of the reasons why the United States did well in the Cold War in the 70s and 80s was that the United States could, dem de could demonstrably produce physical goods which mattered to people in the physical world. I would suggest in the 21st century that the, the table has been a bit turned. Um, Russia doesn't produce things that people want any more than, than it did in the, 19, the Soviet Union did in the 80s. But the competition is not there anymore. The competition is what the Russians very intelligently call the psychosphere. They can get to a psychosphere, the American psychosphere, without producing anything except images. And so why not? So this is, I think, the exception, which then in the second part of what I want to say is going to lead me back towards, towards, towards Bob's argument. And the, the second thing has to do with Eurasia, not as a place, but as a concept. There's a long tradition in, in Russia of, of treating Eurasia as an ideal, as, as a notion, as a place that Russia might take the world. This begins after the Bolshevik Revolution with certain immigre thinkers of the 1920s who have the idea that the beauty of Russia is that Russia is Asia. The beauty of Russia is that Russia escaped Greece, Rome, uh, it escaped uh, it escaped the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Counter-Reformation. It escaped the Enlightenment. All of this thanks to Asia. This is what the Russian Eurasianist thinkers say. Hence, Russian politics should be oriented towards avoiding all of those things, disrupting them, or destroying them. Now, that's, that is a very strong trend in Russian political thought 
which has been revived since the 1990s by thinkers who are important in Russia today. The most important Russian Eurasian thinker was a man called Lev Gumilov, um, who, was, who lived during the Soviet period, who Mr. Putin cites in his speeches. So Mr. Putin brings back into the Russian language this idea of Eurasia. We have to think of Eurasia in this sense as an idea. But I'm agreeing now with, with Bob, I think, when I say that it's not a traditional imperial idea of creating power or creating order. It's rather an idea which is meant to disrupt and to disorganize, specifically when directed towards the European Union. So Bob mentioned Russian attempts to disrupt in, in Poland, in, in, in Eastern Europe. The same kinds of policies have also been applied in France and Germany and in Scandinavia, not to mention the United States. The interesting thing, and I'm trying to give credit where credit is due, thanks, is the idea that we are, we are going to teach you that the European Union is not really possible. What's real is empire, or what's real is the nation state. When Russia interferes on cyber in Europe, it is almost always on the side of the populists or the anti-EU people who are making the case that we ought to leave the European Union or the European Union ought to collapse. Now, this, let me say one more thing. So the conclusion to bring us back to the old world of empire is this. If you look at this map of Eurasia, you can see some kind of Chinese empire, because the Chinese empire, the tributary empire, was on land. You cannot see the important European empires because they're maritime. Okay, this is a very obvious point, but the idea of the West Europeans going back to empire is a complete non-starter. That's something which fortunately is not going to happen. And so when people think of the end of the European Union, what they think of is back to the nation state. And here is the big trap of Eurasia. This is the trap. This is the bottomless pit of European politics. This is the bottomless pit of Brexit. There is no history of the nation state in Europe. The great privilege of Europeans is that they went directly from empires which exploited other people directly with no intermediate stage into an integration zone in which they traded with one another. They had the unique privilege in the history of the world of not ever actually having to try to do a nation state, which is a very hard thing to do. They don't remember this because they teach themselves crazy histories about the nation state, which didn't happen. Right? Every European thinks there must have been a moment when we were a nation state, and that moment was when they were being mistaught in elementary school. It didn't actually happen in the world of history. And so the deep trap of Eurasia as a concept of breaking Europe down into empires that will never return or into nation states that never were is that there's not a future there. Right? That's the way Eurasia works as an idea inside Europe. Tim, thank you very much indeed. And again, just bringing together a quick thought from what you said back to what Robert said at the uh, beginning. It's worth remembering that when we think about the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, Bob mentioned you know, as a reincarnation, the sense of certain wider ideas of Chinese influence, it's also, amongst other things, a borderless cyber um, community or empire in the making. If Belt and Road is put forward in a successful, collaborative way, that will mean a whole variety of international norms, including on cyber, that are decided by Beijing and not in Washington or elsewhere. So the possibilities of those borders actually being dissolved in a direction that's much more at the eastern end of the Eurasian uh, landmass is something that we should at least, I think, be discussing and debating. And I'm sure we will very soon, but not before we turn to the question of religion, I think, and faith, and how that fits into these questions about shaping communities and empires. And we'd be delighted to uh, bring Brie in at this point. Brie. Thank you. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is some, some of the difficulties with mapping religion onto these notions, because at least in, uh, not with their historical legacies, but in, in fact how they look at the moment, uh, religion complicates the, the notions of these maps. It doesn't fit necessarily into each of these maps quite squarely. And if you think about any particular place on these maps, you might be able to map a uh, religious majority and then try to define the nature of that place in terms of the character of the religious majority. But mapping religious majorities obscure the existence of religious minorities. Uh, and religious minorities play a tremendous role in the shaping of a particular society, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis the way the, the state uh, decides to allow religious freedom to operate or not. So you can have plural states where 
uh, there's a preference, a preference for a particular religious majority or even a preference for a particular religious minority that allows religious uh, pluralism but, gives, but constrains it in a way where only a certain number of actors are able to operate in that space. For example, in, in China, where uh, the, the state constrains who, who is able to be a, uh, an identifiable religious actor. Um, religion itself uh, operates in a transnational fashion, and it's operated in a transnational fashion since its beginning. What's interesting now, so the, the largest social movement that we would say at, in our shop, at, at my center, that's the beginning of globalization is the missionary movement of the 19th century. The missionary movement is a transnational movement, um, and what's happening today is what looks like the reverse flows of ideas and people and institutions. So instead of having European nations going out into the rest of the world, you have nations like Korea and Nigeria uh, and the Philippines being the sending nations for these transnational notions. But religion also operates hyper-locally. Religion is lived out in a particular environment and community. So fundamentally, if religion is about identity, institutions and ideas, those things operate on multiple scales that obscure some of these, bo these borders. Um, we often think about religion in terms of its, um, its role in, in regional and geopolitical conflict. Um, and we often want to uh, get to very simplistic notions of where identities and affiliations play within those regional conflicts. Someone uh, recently told me, you know, when you talk about root identity issues related to conflict, think of a, think of a tree. And then notice how the, the simplistic idea of a root having a single cause, right? A tree doesn't have a root, it actually has a root system. And as trees go bigger, as, as, as conflict grows bigger, the system of, uh, that it, or the root causes actually grow and complexify to support that root, as uh, to support that tree. And I thought that that was a great metaphor to understand and not uh, get into the caution of oversimplifying some of these uh, geopolitical conflicts with uh, simplistic binaries like Sunni and Shia, uh, which, don't, which don't work. Um, and I would also say that when we think about the religious character of civilizations or we think about the geographies in which they play out, we can, uh, underscore, we can oversimplify the way in which uh, zones of cooperation existed um, across those geographies. So rather than now thinking of sort of the, the Mediterranean is where the, the middle, the North Africa meets Europe, thinking about that in sort of the Middle Age period where there was some form of cooperation and uh, uh, flows of people and goods and ideas across that boundary. So in a much more unified way rather than one that was uh, created a, a false border. Bree, thank you very much. There's huge amounts there to um, discuss and we've got plenty to discuss there. I might want to just cap that with a brief thought about a character who may be known to some people here, here in terms of those connections. Someone called Kumarajiva figure from medieval China who uh, lived on the edge of Robert's world uh, from a Turkic background, uh, the uh, edge of the Taklamakan Desert, which is today in Xinjiang in China. He was kidnapped and brought to Chang'an, the capital of Tang Dynasty, or well, later Tang Dynasty China. He was before the, the Tang, learned Chinese and translated many of the key Buddhist texts from Sanskrit into Chinese. And the connection with the present day is that even today when Chinese worshippers and their millions are reciting the Lotus Sutra. They're reciting the words of Kumarajiva, that Central Asian translator who had to learn Chinese himself in the first place, as a legacy of that period of crossing borders mm -hmm. and those very, very fluid boundaries between Central Asia and the, uh, the Chinese world at that particular time. So perhaps that's an indication of the kind of unexpected connections that we see during this, this time uh, and period uh, coming up to our own day. We have... Um, about 15 minutes or so now to discuss many of the aspects of what Robert, Bree, and Tim have brought up here today. Um, and I'm be, be very happy to take hands with questions or comments from the audience. So I'm going to take two or three at a time and then bring them back to our panel for a bit of further discussion. So I hope we're going to have some brave souls in the audience who might want to start us off. And do tell us, everyone who speaks, who you are and where you're from. Yes, at the back, sir. Oh, yep, with a mic. Mohammed Jafar from uh, Kuwait. Question to uh, Dr. Kaplan. You spoke of benevolent Tsars who were forward thinking. Were you thinking of Peter the Great? And do you think that what's happening in Saudi Arabia today is similar to what Peter the Great was trying to do in Russia? 
Okay. I see. So the connections between Peter the Great and uh, today's reforms in Saudi Arabia discussed. That's a great, uh, <laughs> great comparison. Just see if there are a couple more that people want to, to bring in as we start the discussion. Any other brave hands as we sit here? Yes, one in the middle there. Go ahead, sir. All right, this is fairly forward thinking and provocative, but after the last session in this room, it makes sense. In a world where we don't rely on fossil fuels to the degree we do today, how different is your forecast for the future? Okay, okay a very, very good point about energy, which keeps everything, uh, everything going in that, uh, in that context. Let's take a couple of these points uh, back to our panel. Peter the Great and the comparisons with contemporary Saudi Arabia, Robert. Does that fit into um, your framework? Yeah, mm -hmm. a, n a number of points. First of all, um, I don't think it really works very well because um, Moh uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, said in 2015, I think, that you know he had a possibility of settling Yemen in two months. And I've traveled all through Yemen a number of times. Uh, and it's a very, it's sort of the Afghanistan of the Arab world, where even under Ali Abdullah Saleh, nobody was able to really govern it. And he hasn't been able to do that. He wanted a quick knockout punch in Qatar. He hasn't gotten it. He tried very clumsily to affect uh, the government in, in Lebanon. He didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not seeing foreign policy success. Uh, from Mohammed bin Salman, even though he's quite popular internally mm -hmm. because, because of his reforms. On fossil fuels, um, I actually think that the, en the most important energy revolution for geopolitics in Eurasia is not, is, is not renewables. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it's the geological fr fracturing revolution in the United States, the gasification plants that have been built, the liquefaction facilities that have been built, which, ha which have <laughs> enabled uh, countries like Poland or others in, in Central Eastern Europe with, um, uh, with either coasts or access to pipelines from, co from coast to import natural gas from other than Russia. And though this has not ended Russia's you know, vast pharaonic fight pipeline system of gas into Europe, it's, make, it's made it harder for Russia to use natural gas in such an overt political manner. And it will make it harder still in, in the future, I think. So this is where technology is affecting geopolitics. And one thing I would just add is that everything Tim said about how right, you know, what Russia is doing you know, to the United States, to, you know, to Western Europe, while Russia is doing this, China yeah. is beating the pants off yeah. of Russia in, in the Russian Far East, throughout Central Asia. Um, uh, you know, you know, the Chinese are like taking over Central Asia, which given its former Soviet republics, where people speak Russian as a lingua fran franca, is something that's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Tim. On, on the question of, of uh, fossil fuels, a map that I would like to see is the map of Chinese uh, food supplies and freshwater supplies from the year 2035, which I think is a map which would have to go further north um, and further south than the maps that we're looking at. Um, in, in response to Peter the Great, the, um, the, the, the grand long-term question that Russia had a problem with, hey, I'm trying to do justice to your Peter the Great question, mm -hmm. trying to help you. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the long-term problem that Russia had and has still is the problem of succession. And when I think about China and 5, 10, 15, 50 year long planning, I, I have to say the classic historian's question is the question of succession. How do you transfer power across generations? And then on this issue, it's, I, I, I have this private theory which is unprovable that the reason why Russia engages along these lines of Eurasia with the Europeans and the Americans is that it's rewarding. It's fairly easy to cause a lot of trouble in Europe. It's fairly easy to cause a lot of trouble in the United States, precisely because they're open societies with ideas and cyber. You can have rewarding outcomes or personally satisfying outcomes. Um, and I believe that that goes hand in hand with Bob's point. I believe that this is all one enormous distraction for the Russian elite. It doesn't make sense for the Russian elite to be paying this much attention to the West when their real concerns are actually entirely elsewhere. Just a very brief follow-up on that and just putting your historian's hat back on for a second, Tim. 
Would you say that the question about fossil fuels expressed something important about the way in which that Russian empire emerged in the late modern period through the 18th, 19th, 20th century? I mean, Russia is a country which has obviously had to think about resources. If you think about modernization and Stalinization, I mean, it was Lenin actually who said that the Soviet power was um, the Bolshevik uh, control plus electrification of the entire country. How important is that question of resources in understanding the way in which empire actually forms? Right, that's a, that's a quick and easy one. So, um, <laughs> so the, 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 fir the first Russian empire is an, is an agrarian empire. Um, the most agrarian part of the Russian empire then, now, forever is Ukraine, which is a major agricultural exporter. Russia is not, right, and, 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 probably, and probably won't be. The Russian quote unquote empire of today has to do with the export of, of fossil fuels and the difficulties that Russia faces today are the classical developmental difficulties of getting across um, an oligarchic fossil fuel driven economy into one where you can promise social advancement. <coughs> that. Let's uh, keep going back to our, uh, our audience here and again take a, a couple more uh, points. There's one right here in the front. Yes, sir. we get a microphone to you. It's just coming around. Again, tell us who you are. So I'm, I'm a farmer from India and I think uh, food's insecurity with climate change, how could that impact these? going forward in 30, 40 years, because as you say, Russia could be a great food exporting uh, nation with climate change. And how is China going to feed itself going forward? Is that an insecurity which, which it needs to think about maybe 30, 40 years from now? Excellent question. Thank you for that, sir. And could we see any others? Do we have a bit of gender balance perhaps in the questions as well? Do you please? Yes, a lady there. Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, my name is Victoria. I'm Global Shaper from Lviv, Ukraine Hub. Ah. My question is, uh, what should actually become real in history so the Russian Empire come back to its Russian borders? Indeed, so historically informed there as well. Thank you for that. And I think as we saw one more in the middle there. Let's take that and then come back to our panel. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Pastiano from Bulgaria, now based in London. If you think that over the next two, three decades, do you think China or Russia will be a more disruptive power long term? And if it's Russia, what's in it for them? So why are they disruptive? Because you said it's kind of self-defeating destruction for them and have a bigger fish to fry. Thank you for three excellent questions. And they're quite forward facing. So before I get my panel to reply, I will just remind you that this is the first of three sessions. And the next, the next one will deal with the present. Uh, and the last one will deal with the future more explicitly. It's a little bit like Dickens' Christmas Carol, if you've ever read that. So while we are not ghosts, we are going to make sure that when we speak of the present, we will do so in the context of you know, the wider historical perspective uh, as well. Not that that will stop us, I think, from doing any of those, um, those sorts, of, uh, uh, sorts, of, uh, sorts of things, I'm, uh, I'm sure. Um, let me uh, bring it back perhaps um, first to Robert with that question of disruption that we had at the end there in terms yeah. of, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, because China and Russia b may both be autocratic, but that's where the similarities end. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. vastly different. And Russia is currently, I would argue, more disruptive than China. Um, it, it's harder to do business with the Russians than with the Chinese um, today. Um, the Chinese, I've noticed, and I've traveled all through China, is when you criticize them in print, they invite you to give speeches at their think tanks. Uh, so yeah. you criticize them quite often to get yeah. the free airfare, I guess. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And, you know, the best example of this is probably the most critical academic on, against China is John Mearsheimer, mm -hmm. and he's always in China. You know, um, kind of. You know, the Chinese are very, very smooth in this regard. Um, they're, um, you, you know, they're very methodical, businesslike. Um, if Xi Jinping were to, uh, you know, were to get ill or sick, or sick, they could orchestrate a succession plan. It would all be very organized, most likely. Um, it's harder to imagine that in Russia. You know, in Russia, you could think of, you know, if there was a real disruption at the top of, you know, of, of a real level of instability, because Chinese institutions are stronger than Russian institutions. They're, you know, they're more built, and therefore, when the Chinese negotiate, um, you know, it, it's not that it's easy to negotiate with the Chinese. It's that the Chinese understand that they can push the American Navy away from the South and East China Sea 
provided they never have to fight, because the Chinese method of war is winning without having to fight. Um, the Russians send thugs with ski masks into the Ukraine, whereas the Chinese will, set, will, take, uh, will take one part of a geographical feature in the South China Sea and occupy it and only eight months later build an airstrip on it or something. Uh, you know, China's form of aggression, I would argue, so far has been far more subtle and nuanced than the Russian form of aggression. So that, uh, you know, China is, um, you, know, you know, China has a vision. It has a, it's an alternative vision to democratic capitalist America, but it is a vision for the region, which is rooted in its history. It's unclear that Russia has a vision at this point, except a negative one. Free, I wonder if I could just uh, pick you up, uh, sure. come to you in terms of one of the words in the question, which is the word disruption. Because mm -hmm. it, strikes me, it strikes me that religion does many things, particularly in the region we're talking about, but Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, these are all forces which actually have been political in terms of the way that they've changed societies as much as they've been about faith. And I'm wondering, historically speaking, do you see religion as a force more for disruption or more one that has perhaps the capacity to stabilize in this area? And is disruption always bad? Uh, well, it strikes me that what's really interesting is that uh, China doesn't seem to have the same uh, benevolent response to criticism when it comes to religion. So I have colleagues who, uh, like Feng Yang Yang at Purdue University, who's a, a works on religion in China, in particular Christianity, who's had a lot of trouble related to his travel because of some of the, the things that he said in the current moment. And I do think as we look about at global Christianity, just to go back to the last question, China poses a very interesting shift uh, if projections for yeah. global Christian growth, sure. if projections for Christian growth in China come to be, where there could be up to 100 million Christians in China by 2050, that will change uh, that will have a, a dramatic impact on the character of what Christianity looks like as it shifts from a global sort of north religion to a, a religion centered in the global south. Um, I think that religion is always a, a dynamic phenomenon. And so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to paint a global picture of its disruption, or its dislocation, or its stability because it's largely dependent upon on where it's taking place. Well, Davos, of course, is one of those forums where disruption has quite often been painted as being a positive in terms of moving things forward. So. I, I think that uh, we just completed a study on religion and innovation um, in Los Angeles uh, and in Seoul, South Korea, at my university, at my center. Um, and what we would say is that right now we're in a, a period of tremendous religious and institutional flux overall. But what, the, what that is creating at the moment is a, a tremendous amount of creative energy going into remodeling uh, religious institutions in ways that meet contemporary needs. And if anything, that is the human project of religious creation, which is to continually remodel itself um, to meet whatever the contemporary challenges are while bringing forward these legacies and ghosts of past. So I'm, uh, I, that's, my, that's my overall Absolutely. view. Thank you. Tim, I think you're going to take the question from the lady from Ukraine over there. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me try to group the question about Russia, Russian Empire, with the question about confrontation with Europe, because I think it comes down to the same thing. I think Russian foreign policy has to be understood as a very intelligent response to the limitations of Russian domestic policy. It has a great deal to do with time and with progress and whether you believe in progress. If, Russia, if, if Russian domestic politics disable um, reforms that would allow social advancement for the rest of the population. If democracy is unthinkable, that is free and fair elections are unthinkable um, because of the way the state is now designed, you respond intelligently by discrediting the United States and discrediting the European Union as alternatives. You, you weaponize and mobilize people's perfectly logical mistrust by saying, yes, you mistrust us, but you should also mistrust the Europeans and the Americans. They're no better. Right? That's a very intelligent domestic policy. The foreign policy complement to that is that you make the Americans and the Europeans look as messy and unattractive as possible. And you can do that cheaply in some cases, as, as has just been done with a cyber campaign, which cost about as much as the tire of an F-35. I think less, right. actually. Um, so, so, th so this goes back to what, so the question goes back to, what, to Russia as a state. I mean, my, my, own, my own sense is that the succession issue is crucial here. You can't, no one knows what's going to happen in Russia. There is no mechanism for what's going to happen in Russia, precisely because elections have been discredited by the person who currently holds the office of president, 
no one knows what happens next. And that uncertainty has to be exported against a soft target, which is the EU and which is the Americans, in a way which can attract and rally the population, right? Because you can't solve the key problem. So Russia will become Russia when the succession problem has been solved. From the Ukrainian point of view, there are all kinds of reasons to object, and I understand all of them, to the Russian invasion of sovereign Ukrainian territory. I think the, the reasons for Russia's Eurasian campaign against Ukraine go back to problems that are deep within Russia itself. And let me pick up the, 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 uh, the last point, the first question we had from this section, which was about food security. Uh, I should add that I'm a specialist on modern China history and politics myself, and so I was interested by the way you phrased part of the question, which was, can China feed itself? Because actually China has almost never fed itself. It's always been a, a country that imports food, whether it's rice or grain. And it's often in the case of China and other countries, the time when it's tried to be an autarkic empire when it comes to food security, that it's come to grief, most notably during the Great Leap Forward of the 1950s and 60s, when a combination of false statistics and false ideas about uh, self-sufficiency mm -hmm. led, in fact, right. to a very, very major famine. Yeah. So perhaps I could just take a quick round. I mean, um, Robert, perhaps to, to start there, you talked in your book, uh, The Revenge of Geography, about the way in which agricultural empires and different sorts of capacity to be able to feed people is a way in which these societies shape themselves. In a world of cyber war, in a world where we are kind of producing high value uh, economies, are these thoughts still relevant for the present day? I would say less so, because of the shrinkage of geography through the defeat of distance by technology. And I mean maritime pathways as well as cyber pathways. You know, jet airports, everything. Um, you know, it, you know this, for, if, this is a world that has to be based on free trade. You know, ultimately. It doesn't mean you cannot get better trade deals, you know, et cetera. But it's ultimately about, in fact, the basis of American power has been as a, as a free trading, liberal, maritime, <laughs> empire of sorts. There are some and, quite prominent people in the US administration today who don't entirely agree. Yeah, well, I'm getting to that. Mm -hmm. and, and the withdrawal from free trade may, may, you know, may uh, raise the curtain on the decline of American power that began in the Caribbean in the 19th century. I mean, America is a foreign power. Uh, and, and in terms of food supplies also, uh, and climate change, um, I think what we really have to pay attention to, this is a bit off subject, is countries like the Bangladesh and the Nile Delta are in ruler flat territory, uh, one inch above sea level, where the slightest change in sea level rise could put tens of millions of people at risk. And the, real, and the first um, casualty uh, the first thing that happens with sea level rise is not drowning, it's alkalinity in the soil, which makes the soil less productive for food supplies. Thanks. Uh, Tim, did you want to come? Um, well, what, what, you're the expert. When I, but when I look at China from the outside, I see a country that has living experience in massive political famine. Right. And I see, I see a government which is, which is very keen to prevent even the thought of something like that ever yeah. happening again. So it does, it's not just the standard development project where you want to make sure that people are fed and that they get more meat from year to year. There's also this deep and lurking trauma having to do with famine, which was created by the same party that governs the country now. And I, 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 I wonder if, there, if that doesn't create possibilities for chains of events. Like, for example, imagine that there is an especially hot summer and during that hot summer, countries like Russia and Ukraine temporarily cease to export, which leads China to, um, to mass purchase food commodities in advance, which then leads to bread shortages in Egypt, which then leads to political unrest, which then leads to a movement throughout the Middle East, which then leads to changes in power, which then leads people like Professor, like Mr. Putin to, be, to worry more about dictators being overthrown, which then leads the Russian Federation to invade Ukraine. That happened. Mm -hmm. That whole chain of events happened, right? So the lightning quick connections between resources and perceptions are already upon us because of climate change combined with cyber across various political vectors. Bridget, do you want to brief I comment? I just wanted to add that I, I think that as we look at social conflict and uh, p potential for social or natural disasters, what you'll see in places where there have been um, 
restrictions on, say, religious freedom are the opening of those opportunities for uh, international NGOs and religious NGOs to come in and recalibrate how services are delivered by um, filling a niche that states can't fill in response to, to disasters that they can't meet. Bree, that's a great agenda for the next two parts of this series, which in just a minute, I'm going to hand over to Robert to uh, wrap up these sessions to tell us what's going to come next in this particular sequence. Before I do that, just a couple of quick uh, notices. One is that if you want to take up these themes even more quickly, that in 30 minutes at half past five, Parag Khanna will be undertaking a seminar on connected corridors, and you can see, I'm sure, where the links are there. And also Shirley Ann Jackson, who works, who's going to be giving uh, one of the other sessions in this series a little later on, will also be on, on Friday at 11.45. But before I hand over to Robert, just to say we have had a tremendous tour de force, tour de horizon, all sorts of tours around here, both through time and through the space of Eurasia. So could I thank our panel, Robert Kaplan, Brilis Kota, and Tim Snyder. Yes. What happens next? Uh, what, what happens at, I think it's 5.30, is what we've emphasized, what my talk emphasized was the past. Uh, we're going to now do the present with Parag Khanna, who's going to talk for 20 minutes. He's going to talk about all the corridors, you know, you, you, know, all the, you know, all the granular details of Belt and Road, how it actually plays out all the maritime pathways, the supply chains. If you're interested in supply chains, Parag Khan is your man, you know? So he's gonna layer all of this on top of what I was saying on empires. And then there's the third one to come as well with Shirley yes, Ann Jackson. the third one is Friday. Uh, it's, I think it's at two o'clock, and it's that's where, 11 it's 11.45, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's at 11.45, Professor Shirley Ann Jackson of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the president there, is going to talk about the future. You know, all the demographic, economic, uh, technological elements that will go on top of Parag's talk. And, you know, and end with like an organic conception of what Eurasia, greater Eurasia, will look like in 2030. Plenty to look forward for. Thank, look forward to. Thank you for joining us, and look forward to seeing you further during the forum. Thank you. Mm -hmm.